two writers, one just starting out, the other a bestseller. Join James Blatch and Mark Dawson and their amazing guests as they discuss how you can make a living telling stories. There's never been a better time to be a writer. Hello and welcome to the Self-Publishing Formula podcast with James Blatch and Mark Dawson here in the United Kingdom in the centre of the European Union. Sort of For not much longer. <laughs> on the air. On the edge of the European Union. I mean, we are, we've always physically been on the edge of the European Union. And we're now literally m- and figuratively. figuratively. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Uh, well, the times they are changing. And uh, I guess that's a theme to this podcast, isn't it? Because it's a new industry, an exciting new industry. Um, I must tell you, I, I know you're dying to say something. Shut up. Um, I must tell you, go on, say no, something. No, I wasn't going to say anything. I must oh, wait. Okay. I do what, occasion- what gems are you going to bestow upon us this time? I do occasionally get told off for not letting you speak. Um, but it doesn't bother me. Okay. Um, what I was going to say is I did an interview yesterday, which I think is coming up on May the 4th, International Star Wars Day, of course, with um, a small publisher in East London. And I absolutely loved talking to this guy. His name is Jasper Joffe. And Joffe Books is the publisher. Mm-hmm. And I'm just doing a little preview of it because it felt so significant to me that there's this guy who is a Dawsonian man you know he's done your course he listens to joe penn and everyone he's soaked up all this stuff he understands how social media advertising can work and how visibility works in this very modern way of selling indie books and he's created a effectively a traditional publishing house you know he he takes submissions he picks one in a hundred or so of the people who, who come forward uh and he's just going like bilio and of course he is right because mm. Because it's not rocket science that you can't go on in the old way. And this guy is sitting there. And at one point this year, what did I say to you yesterday? It's seven. We he had seventeen in the top one hundred. Yeah. So I I, I know. I mean, I've known I've known about them for a while. And I, I emailed him just to say, you know, well done. Um, I'm impressed. And would you like to come on the podcast? And he was he was very nice that he was like, oh, I, I you know, as you say, he, he knows who we are, and he he's he's been you know following what I do. And it was, yeah, I'm really looking forward to hearing that one too, because he's done so well. Um, he's had, um, as, as the cleaner was, you know, got up to, I think, number 10 in the store, and he had at least three in the top 10 ahead of it, all from the same author. So I, I know I'm not going to share numbers. I, I have a fairly good idea what he's making every month, and I don't think he'd mind. It's certainly six figures, and I, I would say it's, 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 it's extremely healthy. So, um, no, it's amazing to see um, he just running rings around um, Trad Pub, just as uh, as uh, as dozens of other indies do with with price, with advertising, with outreach to readers. Um, it's everything's possible these days, and he's a really good example of that. Yeah, and I mentioned Michael Andalay in the interview because there's somebody else who's sort of building a stable mm. around the same principles, I think, and. Uh, 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 we need to do this, maybe. Do you think self-publishing formula? It's crossed my mind. Take- I see a couple of times yeah. I, I could publish other people, um, but I have, I just don't know how I would find the time to do that. It's um, I, I, my my first love is still writing, and that will always be the case. I, I get a massive kick with getting my stories out to my readers. Um, SPF takes up about half of my time. Um, beyond that. I don't know where I would find the time to set up an imprint like um, Jasper has done, but you know, never know. You never know. One day, maybe we could look into something like that. But I, I think, I that's, think it'd be a, that's something for the future. I think it'd be a really exciting uh, uh, thing to do. But uh, yeah, so let's put that on the back burner for now. Uh, anyway, I wanted to talk about that because I felt very excited about it, and I'm looking forward uh, to having Jasper on the podcast. On I think, as I say, actually, maybe it's been moved forward. I'm now looking at the uh, the, the fluid plan we have is the 27th of April for that interview. Uh, but we've got a good interview today. And today's interview, I picked this up because um, being a little bit of an aviation nerd, I attract other aviation nerds. And um, and I hope Owen uh, won't mind me calling him that. But Owen Zup, who's uh, in Australia, uh, emailed me and we started anoraking uh, backwards and forwards about uh, our fathers. Actually, our fathers had incredibly similar careers, um, very similar careers. And down to the character of our fathers and the kind of way we were brought up was very similar as well. So we've had interesting conversations about that. The reason that I invited Owen to come onto the podcast is because he's done a couple of things. First of all, he's making money out of nonfiction writing. Question we get asked a lot 
does your does the stuff we talk about on the podcast and in the webinars and the courses does it work for nonfiction? And we'll perhaps talk about that a little bit after the interview. Um, and the second thing he's done is he's taken a personal story, the story of his father, and he's made a commercial success out of a book written about it, which is more difficult than it sounds. I think in particular because it's very difficult to write objectively in a way that's going to be suspenseful and page turning about a story you're so close with and you're trying to sort of tell from an emotional point of view. And I think Owen has cracked that with a very uh, methodical approach to it. So so that's uh, that's the background to Owen's up. Uh, as I say, a little bit of aviation stuff coming up. There's no, no harm in that, of course. Uh, so let's hear from Owen uh, about his book, about his remarkable uh, father, and then we'll, uh, we'll come back and have a chat off the back. So Owen Zup, thank you so much indeed for coming on to the um, the SPF podcast. It's great to be here, thanks, James. All the way from Australia, there will be a bit of a delay, but uh, we'll see what we can do about that in the edit. Um, we've got, um, I mean, you are not the first seven four seven pilot we've had on. You may have noticed Susan Grant, who flies uh, jumbos for uh, United, I think. Um, I got that right yeah I think United and uh, we've had a couple of other people on of course it's a bit of a passion of mine so my eyes light up a little bit when I hear that one of our authors is uh, is in the aviation sphere but the real reason we brought you on we're going to come on to it in a bit is just to talk about the world of the non-fiction self-published author um, because it is a slightly different world and uh, ultimately I think a lot of non-fiction authors feel a little bit on the fringes when they look at a community like SPF and it's all romance and thrillers and mystery uh, but it's very important to us that, uh, that NF gets a proper outing so we'll come on to that in a little bit but what I want to do because you're an interesting gentleman we've had a bit of banter off air about the cricket which is probably just as well because you know half the audience are in America and think it's a small <laughs> insect so we'll probably leave that there and also for uh, English pride I think we'll leave that that conversation aside but let's hear a little bit about you because you've got a, a great background and in particular um, you and I share quite a lot in common in the fact that our fathers flew at around the same era and uh, I, I don't think my father fired a shot in anger but they both achieved quite a lot in their time and that's that's been one of your inspirations isn't it? Absolutely. Uh, my father, as, as you said, he was a combat fighter pilot. He flew 201 missions in Korea and he was an army commander in World War II before that. But he obviously instilled the passion in aviation that I subsequently followed as a career. But as you say, in terms of nonfiction, I wasn't a typical author in that I didn't grow up wanting to be a writer. I uh, enjoyed writing. I enjoyed writing essays and reading but I was always focused on a career in aviation. And as you're well aware, it's a rather technical industry uh, determined by procedures. There is a whole lot of room for creativity when you've got a couple of hundred people down the back. So um, it was really when the airline I worked for collapsed in 2001 that I felt I didn't want to be solely reliant on, on flying as a, a career and a source of income. So I did a master's degree. I did some technical writing and consulting. Uh, and whilst they were rewarding in a fiscal sense, I really didn't enjoy it that much. And I thought if I'm doing it in addition to my profession, I've got to enjoy it. And that's really how I came into writing. I started by writing magazine articles and that led into books, uh, traditionally published. And then from traditionally published, I, I went into self-publishing. So it was a rather convoluted journey possibly compared to, to some of your, your listeners and writers, but uh, that's how I got here where I am today. And out of interest, do you want me asking how old you were when you started uh, the publishing side of your career? Uh, so I would say my first magazine article was published in 2006, so that would have made me 42. Okay, good. Well, it's good that yeah. um, you know it's come to me late in life as well, so or later in life, I should say. Um, so uh, it's good to know that uh, it can be done. I'm sure that would be reassuring to some people. Um, the technical books that you said, and I think you said were traditionally published, that because I've noticed on your Amazon page, are they the, the kind of how to fly, the nuts and bolts of flying? You've done some instructional books. Yeah, no, the traditionally published actually was a title called Down to Earth, and it was a biography of a chap who flew right from Dunkirk through to D-Day. His aircraft actually was dug up on the beach at Dunkirk in 1988 and flew last year it is now, 2017. Uh, in the UK, and it was his wartime story, effectively. So it was a biography. Uh, 
the How to Fly per se books, um, no, they were self published. The technical okay. writing prior to that was was manuals for airlines and things like that. Okay, I was interested in that because um, I mean I did my pilot's license, my private pilot's license in my thirties, and I think the, there's a guy called Trevor Tom who seemed to corner the market on um, on those little instructional books that lots of yes. private pilots bought. And yours look uh, similar to that, but I'm fascinated that that's they're self published. Yes, I. I particularly stayed away from the absolute nuts and bolts of it because I do think that there are good textbooks which are also modified to the syllabus as it changes. I want to write something that was evergreen. And so I have written more the practical aspects, hence the title Practical Pilot. Simple things uh, such as flying with passengers in this day of mobile phones. Watch your passengers so that if they're backing away to take a photo, they don't walk into a propeller. Um, how to offset air sickness with passengers and um, how to fly a decent approach. More the, the, rather than the fine details that you'd get asked in an exam question, the practical approach for a pilot, a low time pilot or a student. Great, and those instructional books, and I know that there are people who, who talk to us all the time who, I mean, sometimes it's self-help or it's instruction in a particular area and they do ask a lot of questions of, of Mark and others in the group. Um, who obviously have a fiction background on what's going to work for them, which of these techniques are going to work for them. So how did you find the marketing of those books, getting the covers done and, and, and so on and getting them to market? And then, you know, did it work? Or, and if so, what worked? I, I think I've tried everything to some degree in the, the traditional sense of marketing, the, the ads, Facebook, AMS, um, having an email list. None of those I've done, I would say, in depth, and that's something I, I want to look to do more so in the future. I would have to say the main marketing aspect was building a brand per se, was the fact that I'd written magazine articles and people came to know my name. Fortunately, Zup, Z-U-P-P is, is more of a sound effect than a name, so people <laughs> tend to remember it, I like think. Like Chandler Bing. Um, yeah, and, and in that industry, having experience, uh, having held grade one instructor rating, chief pilot approvals, etc. The marketing was probably more based upon my reach through my magazine articles and having a degree of credibility from those articles. And I've written not only for Australia, but in magazines in America and in the UK. So to be perfectly honest, I think the marketing was a follow on from being published in magazines in many ways. And uh, that in turn gave me the ability to support those books, either by um, releasing excerpts by knowing the editors or um, just people saying, oh, and stuff's got a new book out. So that was probably the, the impetus most of my marketing, to be honest. Yeah, that's, that is interesting. Um, we get a slight wobbly line here. I hope people will be able to bear with this. Obviously, it's uh, as about as far as you could possibly get two people standing from each other. So one sitting, one standing. But the lines, it lines sort of okay. We'll just give it a second, see if it settles down. But um, um, that's really interesting. So basically, brand building and then some organic um, visibility from that. And this is something that we are going to cover in the uh, in the podcast in the future because uh, we're in an era, I think, where the traditional way of sort of bunging large amounts of money to PR companies to get you that kind of publicity is moving on to something you can really do yourself. And a lot of journalists have their email addresses in newspapers and you can simply drop them an email and say, look, this is my specialist area and here's a really interesting thing about it. Um, will, you, will you take an article? And that's obviously something that worked for you. Absolutely. And another aspect of it is that whilst I started writing voluntarily for association journals, etc. on those first magazine articles, I it wasn't long before I moved into paid articles. So you're also obtaining an income from those articles. So it's effectively building a portfolio of work, uh, which is financially um, rewarding. But also as you move to each level, uh, it supports it. The fact that I wrote for voluntary journals allowed me to get published for pay. The fact that I had a number of uh, magazine published articles, I think, helped me secure the traditional book publishing contract in the first instance. And then having been through that experience, I think led me into self-publishing. So you build a portfolio not solely focused on one avenue and you diversify. And I think that is possibly a lesson I also learned from losing my job, that I didn't want to have all my eggs in one basket. 
Yeah, it's funny how many people can uh, cite losing their job as being one of the major markers <laughs> in the rest of their successful careers. So um, let's let's talk a little bit about you, Owen, because I should have asked at the beginning to you to give us a little bit of your background. I, I think cricket was a passion of yours early on, uh, but at some point, obviously, aviation took over. Yeah, aviation was probably the prime passion. I must admit, as a teenager, I flirted with uh, cricket as a... Um, a potential option but once I started to move up the ladder as such and I saw people of the caliber of Stephen Mark War who were my contemporaries I soon realized that wasn't going to be an option any longer that uh, in no way diminished the passion and I've remained active in in the sport ever since and been involved with the Bradman Foundation down here in Australia so it's remained a passion but I've been very fortunate in that uh, aviation has been my other passion and I was able to do that for my prime profession. So when I think about it, be it writing, cricket or flying, I've been able to do things I love my whole life. I've never really been in the situation where I had to do anything uh, for the grind. There's been short periods when I, I was out of work uh, as a young pilot where I drove courier vans, etc., and that. But even when I was paying for my flying lessons, I was a paramedic and that was an extremely rewarding career. So. I guess in many ways I've been blessed in that I knew what I wanted to do for a job and everything I've done along the way I've enjoyed. Yeah, and there's a lot to be said for that. And um, I don't suppose um, flying at any point becomes something that you treat completely as routine and it's certainly a long way from anyone's idea of a nine to five job. Yeah, it's, it's a challenging job to really dedicate yourself and it does become seemingly routine. I've got over 10,000 hours flying 737s. And the task there is to treat every day with the same level of discipline, much like a, someone on stage. It might be your 500th show, but the person buying the ticket, it's their first show. So you have to bring your A game every day. And um, that possibly is one of the hardest disciplines of, of um, airline flying is to maintain that standard in the face of the, the Groundhog Day effect almost. Yeah. So we did famously have an airline pilot who um, purchased one of Mark's courses and then photographed his laptop open on the flight deck with the control column in front of him um, doing a little bit of the course. And he, when people were slightly alarmed by this, he said that actually they're, he, on the long haul flights, they're encouraged to keep the mind active, do a crossword or Sudoku or something so that they're not, not drifting off. Is that really the case? Uh, it would depend on the airline. We've got a fairly rigid uh, policy on the use of personal devices in the air and we're not actually um, carrying personal apps on the iPad as such. So, uh, it, but I, I can't speak for all airlines. I, I tend to find um, I can stay reasonably focused with the conversation on the flight deck and most people are actually more interested in my writing than uh, the, yes. than the aviation side of things, to be perfectly honest. The last trip I did, the um, other chap was very interested in self-publishing. I could see the wheels turning in his head. Yeah, there you go. It's always a uh, always good time to talk on a flight deck. Okay, so you had this interest in aviation. Obviously, you made that happen to you. And then that also, we should say, it's a competitive career. Lots of young people start out thinking that they're going to be a pilot. And actually, it's a fairly small group who, who end up in the flight deck or the cockpit of a military aircraft. So you've obviously got something about you, Owen. You've got some determination and you've you know um, got some achievements behind you. I can see that's now being applied to your writing career. So you've obviously got the ability to knuckle down, learn the processes and get things done. Was self-publishing from that point of view something you then opted to do or did you think, I, I can't get the traditional publishing off the ground so I'm going to have to resort to self-publishing? No, it was definitely something I made a conscious decision to pursue. I, I did the first book traditionally published and like all people, when they get the first contract, signed it straight away. And it was a wonderful, wonderful experience to have a book launch and see it on the bookshelves. I even got a photo sent from the Smithsonian in uh, Washington that was for sale in, in the US. So all of that experience was marvelous. But I did find that in the traditional world, once your title had been out six or eight weeks, their enthusiasm had peaked. Uh, and even though I was striking opportunities for the book to be kept alive, I couldn't say the support was there uh, in all those situations. So ultimately, 
when I decided to go down the publishing road again, I thought it was at 2013 and I started to become aware of ebooks. I thought I'd give a crack myself to use a colloquialism and I actually enjoyed the process. Uh, I learned a lot. I made a lot of mistakes early on. And to me, that is probably what I enjoy the most. I enjoy challenge. Uh, and writing has definitely brought that to my life and self-publishing did as well. Yeah. And we mentioned your father at the beginning for good reason, because your your latest book and the one that's, uh, I guess, occupying your time at the moment is about your father. Yeah, that's correct. Uh, I titled it Without Precedent because he was awarded American decoration during the Korean War, which he was subsequently blocked from wearing. So that's that's where the title came from. But yes, it was a, a documentation fundamentally of a, a, a boy who grew up on the wrong side of the track somewhat uh, in rural Australia and dreamt of flying. But as he once said to me, might as well have dreamt of going to the moon during the Great Depression. All he knew was, was drowned dead cattle. Uh, but despite that, he, he became an Air Force navigator an army commando. He was first on the ground in Hiroshima, or most, he was one of the first vessels, I should say, and then kept pursuing his uh, dream of flight uh, whilst a mechanic let fly privately and finally got a pilot's course despite his, his poor education. And as we uh, mentioned earlier, flew over 200 missions in Korea and then had a, a very expansive career after he left the Air Force. So it is as much probably the, the narrative of someone who in the face of adversity, continued to pursue their dream despite the odds. And I think that's where it struck a chord with a lot of readers. As much as there is combat, as much as there is fighter jets in Korea and all that interesting action, I think it is the the sub-narrative almost that, that has really brought the audience in because it's proved very popular. And I've had people email me from all around the world and some of the reviews that they actually cry at the end. So I think that um, shows that more than just a textbook style biography. There's a lot more parallels between a novel and a biography than, than sometimes people admit. Yeah, well, I think there certainly should be. I think the person, Absolutely, yeah, yeah. The person who writes a biography and sets out to tell a story is the one who, you know, who's going to do well with it. But that doesn't always happen. And I think one of the traps people fall into is that they're often too close to the story, particularly you're writing about your father. So I'm interested in how you stepped back and made sure, potentially also, uh, is your father still with us, Owen? No, no, he passed away uh, 1991, so he's okay. been gone quite a while. Yeah. I mean, there's, uh, funny, uh, funny enough, because my father's still alive, and I'm writing a fiction book that's sort of roughly based on him, and, you know, there is a potential other element <laughs> to my experience that he will frown on or raise, you know, raise <laughs> his eyebrows a bit. So, but obviously that complication wasn't there for you. But I'm still interested in how you took a step back and thought, well, I... If I just make this an information dump of everything I know about my father, it's not going to be interesting. So you set about from the beginning to turn this into a narrative with presumably some twists and turns and some conceal and reveal moments. Absolutely. As you pointed out, biographies tend to be that textbook style with footnotes and very detailed factual um, content. I tend to find that breaks the flow down. I wanted to tell his story. And as for being remote to the, the subject, as I researched it, it almost felt at times like it was someone who was remote to me because I knew him as a, a very, very quiet gentleman who wouldn't allow my mother to open a door um, and never swore in front of her, ever. An absolute gentleman. And yet when you sit down and read combat reports from New Guinea or Korea, it's almost a different person so from the combat perspective, that wasn't too hard. I interviewed a lot of veterans who served with him and it started to open up a different person to the, the person I knew in the role of a father. And I wasn't writing a book about a father. So that made it somewhat easier. And the other thing I did was I made a conscious effort and I'm sure this worked, was that when I found something in his files that was probably less than ideal, uh, for instance, on his pilot's course, I uh, well, right through until he got to Korea, I think he only got average plus on one occasion. Everything was average. And he always said that. I didn't make him out to be Chuck Yeager breaking the sound barrier with 10 victories. He always said, I just worked at it. I was very average. I worked at it. And I think through his attitude, his records, 
the stories from other people and that almost distant relationship of the man I was reading about and the man I knew allowed me to step back and write it without becoming emotive. And the other thing, obviously, is not writing it from the, the first person perspective of my dad did this. But yeah, yes, there was a few elements, I think, that contributed to that, to that but I was very conscious of not looking at him through rose-colored glasses. Yeah. Gosh, there are so many parallels between you and me, Owen. It's um, it's crazy. <laughs> you could almost describe my father there as well. Um, and I, I'm also discovering the same sort of thing. We should say to people that getting average in a military flying environment is a huge achievement in itself. And you know, very occasionally in my father's book, there is an above the average and one exceptional. Uh, and he did go on to be a test yeah. pilot. But, you know, that, that's one yeah. exceptional and maybe two above the averages out of 30, um, you know, times where he's, he's marked up. Average was an achievement. Absolutely. And, and I can say as a flight instructor, average are the best students. Um, over the years, you tend to find the people who are, uh, a brimming with confidence and and think that they're the new Top Gun. They were rather hard to teach. Yeah. Well, my dad also told me something interesting um, once when I went visited the National Archive and started looking at his squadron diaries and records. And um, mm. his on his first ever squadron, he was sent out to the Middle East in his in Egypt. And after about two months, one of the pilots killed a guy called Pete Coots. And uh, it, there's a brief description of him being killed in the afternoon and then they buried him the next morning and then they carried on flying. And I mentioned it to my dad and said, do you remember this guy, Coots? And he said, oh, yes. When I introduced to him, he was like the daredevil in the squadron. He flew a bit faster, mm. a bit lower, a bit, you know, it was almost a description of Maverick from Top Gun. This was the guy who had yes. all the tall stories. And my yes. dad said what struck him is after he died and spread his jet over a sort of two miles of the desert, everyone just shrugged their shoulders and thought, well, we knew he was going to do that. And there was, and they carried on yeah. with their business. They kind of knew, because there's, there's an old expression, isn't there? There are old pilots and there are bold pilots, but there aren't any old, bold pilots. So yeah, it's a, that's a really, really <laughs> interesting observation from your, your point of view. Absolutely. And uh, it, it was one of the elements I was struck by was, as you mentioned with your father, that they were able to have this tragedy and carry on. Uh, and it was just the way it was. I found one letter of correspondence to my mother during the war, and uh, my f mother actually, her job in the Air Force was to process the correspondence of those who'd been killed in combat. And there's a another story in that as well. But um, she would look at these, and I found this letter, and, and my father simply wrote, oh, you probably know Colebrook's dead by now. Um, the boys in the tent next door seem a bit upset, but they'll get used to it. That was his only reference. And I often think that was a product of having served as a commander in World War II as much as anything. Yeah. I mean, I do think the more I look into it and the more I think reflect on my father's life, uh, I'm certain that although there was this stiff upper lip, that casualness that which there had to be in, in my, my father's mm. test pilot era, they lost a lot of people quite mm. often in a close environment, almost like being in combat, actually, the numbers he lost in that mm. six-year period. Um, but I don't think he came out of it unscathed. I don't think mm. probably your father didn't come out of it unscathed. It, it, things mm. get buried, and which is yes. when you described your father, you described my father as well. Not not ne necessarily brilliant, a little bit uncommunicative, not all mm. that comfortable with, with sharing emotions. So I don't think we should always say, oh, they had a stiff upper lip in those days. They knew how to cope with things. Yes. I, th I think it had its effect. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, so it's a, yeah. it's a it's a fascinating era, and you can people will probably tell that um, once I started uh, looking into what you were writing about, it had a, a, a lot in common with the sort of uh, the situation I find myself in. So, but going back to the, we should bring this back to the marketing and the um, absolutely uh, yeah, the kind of publishing aspect of it. So you've got your 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 book on your father, this biography, uh, which looks yes. all, a little bit almost like a fiction book from the way you presented. I think that's probably a conscious decision as well. That's clearly is a biography, but it's it's a kind of um, story from right from the beginning, and that that's how yes. you've decided to market it, right? Yes, yes, it. Um I wanted to, I've always said with my writing, particularly as aviation is a technical game, I would rather tell you the colours of the sunrise and the fact it happens at 0619. And that is what I wanted to do with this book. I wanted people to identify with who my father was and become emotionally attached to him, which is something we do 
in fictional writing with a, with a main character. So there was a conscious effort there. There was also a conscious effort in the self-publishing process to take it to the next step. My first ebook, to be perfectly honest, was an experiment. And I threw 50 of my articles together, published the ebook in 2013, went on a flight to Honolulu, and by the time I got there, it sold about 300 copies, uh, which I saw that's when the, the penny dropped for me, but I had to then go and learn about cover design and put it in chronolo uh, sorry, chronological order, etc. And this book about my father without precedent was the next evolution along that long process in that I hired a cover designer, I hired someone with, with eternal formatting, I pulled all the strands together. So for me, it's been a, a learning process too, from that first ebook where I put 50 magazine articles together in a somewhat haphazard manner in the first instance to now that I've got it done through Ingram that you can get it paperback or hardback. Uh, you can get it as an ebook. And then I even sought to distribute it myself. I went through a commercial distributor and I looked at what he wanted to charge me. So I then started to contact major book chains in Australia myself. They were somewhat resistant because I wasn't coming through the normal channels. So I sent them copies. They had to review that it was up to standard by their, their standards. And uh, it got into major bookstores that way. But as I said, it's the latest step in the evolution and the learning process for me from a, an ebook experiment to something that comes in three formats and is, is in major bookstores. And do you think you're going to follow up this book? I mean, that's one of the other things, of course, people in fiction will be planning their series very often um, with a biography of your father, which presumably comes to a conclusion. Uh, where do you go? It's, it's funny you mentioned that because I um, there was very much film interest uh, from the US in my father's story. Uh, they did have trouble seeing that it would work as an Australian lead. They have come back to me about getting a screenplay done. And in the process of doing that, I spoke to them about my mother's story. And my mother was a World War II radar operator in the Air Force. Uh, in summary, she had a boyfriend who she broke up with. She was engaged to another chap. Both of them aircrew, both of them were killed in action. And uh, she subsequently withdrew somewhat and rejoined the Air Force before meeting my father. Now there's a number of overlaps there in that um, her fiance's squadron used to fly top cover for my father as a commando in New Guinea. Um, my mother's fiance's bomber is now in the war memorial and so is my father's jet. So there's a lot of parallels between their two lives before they ever met. And mum's is more of a, a romance and a tale of love and loss. So therein lies the overlap and the series, I suppose you could say. Uh, and it's my mother's story that will be my, my next major work and it's well underway actually. And I think it will actually have a broader appeal. The big marketing aspect for me that I have to consider is that my predominant reader is, is male 20 to 60, but this opens up a broader audience. Does traditional publishing open the door to that female audience and that in a way that I don't have ready access to? So that'll be a, a, a business decision once I've got the book written, but I'm definitely uh, well into writing my mother's story and I think it will actually have more of an appeal to a broader audience than my father's, to be honest. If I was to summarize, I'd say my father's a documentary, my mother's a movie. Mm. Well, it would be fascinating to see how that goes. And um, and also, if you end up box setting those two, you'll be introducing one half of the audience to the other half and um, they may well enjoy it. So, Absolutely. And someone said I should write my biography as a trilogy, but at 53, I think it's a tad premature. <laughs> <laughs> I think you should write a fictional biography of yourself where you outbat Mark War. Uh, and Steve War, and you are the one who emerges. And even if you could write me into it and we could have a big Ashes uh, moment at the SCG, that would be great. Um, anyway, obviously Hugh Jackman and Nicole Kidman should be lined up to play your, your father and mother. I can see um, I can see all this happening. Yeah, Nicole's got a house not far from here, actually, so I, there you go, I ran into up. them at the, uh, the play gym one day, but yeah. Yeah. 
Uh, and how's it gone? So you say that, I mean, you are still flying. I know you've taken a bit of a step back to try and rebalance your life a little bit. And I don't know if we can show it, but there's a great picture because your wife is also a uh, commercial airline pilot and you do occasionally end up on the flight deck together, I think. Uh, we did it once and that was last week. It's the first time uh, we've actually been on airliner together. Oh, well, that, yeah, yeah that, that's fantastic. So your wife's, um, I can't remember from the picture now, whether she's in the left or right hand seat. Is she a uh, first officer? Yeah, we we're actually sitting in the back of the aircraft oh, in, okay. in that photo. So, oh, you yeah, are? Okay. Yeah, but, yeah, but she um, she was a, a 767 pilot with uh, Qantas and then they retired the 767, so she moved on to the 747 from there. But uh, yes, she, we knew each other well before the airlines. We knew each other back in the learning to fly days. Right, and she, you're both on the queen of the skies now, which is uh, wonderful. <laughs> um, so, yeah, I was uh, just asking you, so how, how has it gone? I mean, is this something you can see replacing your aviation income at some point? I mean, obviously, you, you, you say pilots do start to think about retirement in their 50s anyway, I guess. but Absolutely. And I think the, the key there is that this has always been, I, I guess the phrase is the long game for me. The fact that I have a full-time profession takes all the stress of, I need to do this for an income off me. Um, I'm able to say to magazine editors, look, I've got this on this month. I can't produce articles this month. It gives me total flexibility. So for me, all I need is is my laptop and my time. So it's the perfect secondary profession. I would love to write full time, but I love flying. So it is, as you mentioned earlier, it's all about finding the balance between the two. But the long game is that in retirement, which is closer than I like to think, I can transition effectively. I'd like to have a a back catalogue of books all ready to go. I'm writing for a number of magazines. And then as I move into retirement, obviously my writing will become uh, more prevalent. It'll become a, a greater part of my active life. And I've also done an amount of public speaking. So I'd like to do more of that in retirement. So at the moment, it's balance, it's tying it in, but there is definitely a transitional plan for that to occur over the next 10 years. Yeah, and you're making some money at the moment. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. To be perfectly honest, there, were, there have been months where my writing income, uh, virtu- the, the net income virtually matched my flying income. Wow. So it, it, it isn't consistent. Um, and it couldn't be done all the time on on the time I dedicate to it, and that will fluctuate. But it is definitely worth my effort in a fiscal sense, and it's absolutely worth my effort in a passionate sense. Yeah. Great. Well, Owen, look, it's been really interesting talking to you, particularly I think the learning point for me is to think with non-fiction authors more about their brand and their visibility uh, in some of the traditional methods of, as you say, magazines and newspapers and maybe doing some some talking and, and appearing on people's programs and podcasts, working well for you in a way that for fiction writers, that's a slightly more difficult route and they probably are the ones who have to do the grind with the mailing lists and so on. I mean, that's not, it's, it's not definitive. You don't rule yeah. one out on, the, on either side, but clearly that's something with the nonfiction area uh, that lends itself a bit more, I think, to your type of marketing. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. Yes, now I'd have to say that, that producing content, getting that content out internationally and your name internationally is a magnificent way to transition and support your books whilst earning an income from that as well. Yeah, superb. Owen, well, I guess I don't know if you're going to come over in 2019 uh, when Australia <laughs> will, uh, I think they're next due to tour uh, the England. But if you do, you'll be very welcome here and we'll, um, we'll show you how to swing the ball. Okay, that'd be great. I might actually be coming over because I do know that uh, I think the Bradman side is having a tour at that time. So I might well come over. Well, that'd be brilliant. You let us know. Owen, thank you so much indeed for joining us. I would love, well, we will definitely keep in touch and uh, we'll follow your progress and good luck with your your transition, which is a bit of an aviation expression as well, isn't it? But uh, your... It is transition level. <laughs> there you go. Well, thanks very much, James. It's, it's been great to chat with you. As you said, we've got so much in common and, and hopefully I brought a bit of the non-fiction aspect to it, but um, I, I love writing, so it, it's it's great to talk about it. So, Owen, very interesting the fact that he makes scraps of money, probably not scraps of money, but, you know, chunks of money just writing magazine articles here and there and build up, uh, has built up a little portfolio of work, which is starting to outstrip some of his flying work, uh, flying pay. And 
Um, that is one of the differences, I think, between fiction and non-fiction is that with fiction, you're investing in your books, generally. Non-fiction, you are often finding other avenues all over the place to make money writing. There are more opportunities. I mean, for fiction, for non-fiction writers, I'd be very excited if I was um, pushing, well, I, we do a little bit of non-fiction with our free books, but um, you know, they're free. We, we don't make any money off of those. But um, if you were to, um, to, to have a, an interesting um, area of expertise that you would wanted to write about, there's two things that are in your advantage. You can charge higher because um, nonfiction readers tend to be less um, price sensitive for fiction um, readers do. But then the, the other thing which is more exciting is that you can, um, you can then effectively use the book as an entree to something else that you're able to sell. So it could be, um, let's just say, looking at you, I'm immediately put in mind of a gymnast, James. So um, we could, um, we, you could be an excellent gymnast and you could write a, 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 a guide to some gymnastic training. But then the, the interesting bit would be that you'd, you'd effectively lead that on to something that you could advertise in the back of that book, knowing that anyone who's got that far is interested in gymnastics. And that was my. What's that? that, was my, was that you? That's you speaking, selling a book. Speaking of money, um, yeah, um, you could then upsell in the back of the book um, a course on gymnastics, on on how to you know, limber up or, or certain moves, that kind of stuff. So it's a terrible example, but it just gives you an idea of what is actually possible with that kind of. Um, yeah, I hate to use the word upsell, but that is kind of what you're doing. You're you're, you're taking the reader who you know is interested in what you're, you're, you're good at and then selling them something, which is probably going to be much more expensive than um, a three, four, five ninety nine um, uh, nonfiction book. So very yeah. exciting. If you're in nonfiction, um, there's so many opportunities right now. Yeah, that, and, and Owen had a good example because he's written these these guides to learning to fly. Um, there's a very famous series called Trevor Tom, uh, which I, I learned to fly years ago, and um, I bought those like everyone else did. And Owen's written a book as more of a supplementary handing, helping hand through the process. But you're absolutely right. It costs probably today about £40,000 to learn to fly, something like that. Um, I think it cost, well, depending on what license you're going to go for, I think it cost about 10 grand in my day. Um, so you're already spending a lot of money. So someone says these books are 50 quid, these four books, you're probably going to pay 25 pounds. Yeah, absolutely. In that. Yeah, absolutely. Good. Good. Okay. Well, I, uh, as you imagine, I enjoy chatting to him. He's also a big cricket fan. He keeps sending me pictures of himself at the, uh, the SEG, the, uh, Sydney cricket ground and so on. So, um, when we do eventually do that, um, SPF trip to Australia, I think we'll probably have a pleasure flight sorted out for us. Sounds great. I mean, uh, and of course, Nathan, Nathan Van Koops in um, in Florida yeah. is also a pilot. Yes, he is. We have a, an aviation undercurrent to SPA. <laughs> well, you do. Good. <laughs> I'm staying on terra firma, that's for sure. Yeah, unless there's a, a lie flat bed for that's you. True. That's true. That's the only flight I might fly do. in that case. Okay, excellent. Look, thank you very much indeed uh, for watching and listening this week. Um, don't forget you can support the podcast at Patreon by uh, going to patreon.com forward slash SPF podcast. Lots of goodies come your way. If you're a gold level subscriber, you will get one of the rare SPF pins. And um, what else? There's got some other things well, coming. Why, why else would you want to, after the podcast last week uh, with Book Lab, um, we will be looking for our next um, guinea pig to get their um, book page, their book, their cover, their blurb um, torn to bits and then put together in what we hope will be a more commercial fashion. Uh, so we will we'll be looking for the uh, the next one. So after David Behrens, we'll be, we'll be looking again. So it, that's available to everyone who's a gold, gold level patron subscriber. Um, and that's worth, I think it's worth a lot to the community to see um, what we come up with, but it's, it's worth an awful lot to the individual authors it could, it could be something that, that suddenly is is worth quite a lot of money if the book starts to sell a bit better after we've had our way with it yeah absolutely so uh, patreon.com forward slash spf podcast that's it we are going to be talking we've got a bit of a technical episode next week we're going to be talking about website design um and that has changed a little bit over recent years it's a thing of beauty today if you go to the right person and we are going to the right person next week believe me okay that's it have a great week writing and a great week marketing your books we'll see you next friday bye-bye you've been listening to the self-publishing formula podcast Visit us at selfpublishingformula.com for more information, show notes, and links on today's topics. You can also sign up for our free video series on using Facebook ads to grow your mailing list. If you've enjoyed the show, please consider leaving us a review on iTunes. 
We'll see you next time.